Thank you, Brother Borders. Let us ask God now for our request. Make it known by lifting up your hand. God, remember me. Our Heavenly Father, we have now approached the closing service of this little short campaign. We thank Thee, Father, with all of our heart for what You've done for us, this group of people. And on our hearts has been written the indelible ink of God that Jesus Christ is still alive and ever living to make intercessions. We thank Thee for this. We pray, Father, that there will not be no one left out, that every person that's in divine presence may receive that what they are lifted their hands for. Break the bread of life to us now further, Father, as we wait to encourage our faith. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. May be seated. There's always something about a meeting that's hard to leave. We battle, fight, struggle across the lands, but then about the time we get to a place where you really begin to know one another, stop and have to go somewhere else. Brother just told me a few moments ago, the brother over there, you all invited me back. I thank you for that. That shows that you still love the Word. I thank you very much. And I'm going now to Vancouver Island. I begin there uh, Tuesday night over at a place called Port Abernia. Abernia. Port Abernia, I believe it is. Over on the other end of Vancouver Island. I'm there for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'm back to Victoria uh, on uh, the island. So if any of your people live around there, well, we'd sure be glad to see you. And I got tomorrow, I'll be traveling. The brethren offered to take me out here fishing. Oh, my, I would like to do that. I just love that. And Brother Rasmus, the last time I was up here, take me out here at Coos Bay or something like that. And, oh, I caught a great big fish that I was about, I, I can still feel that tug on the end of the line. But... I just love that so well, but, you know, I, I wish I could do that. And then to sit around the boat and talk to the brethren and everything, it'd be such a wonderful time, I'm sure. But I just can't do it because them boats going back and forth are crowded with people. We may have to wait for maybe a day to get over there. And the boats are so crowded, they say, sometimes bringing 400 and better sh- cars at one time. Someone told me you have to have a reservation a day before to get across in many places. So... Wish I could take that trip, brethren. Oh, my. Uh, I hope you get to go, and I'll be enjoying it because you are, you see. But sometime way across on the other side when the rush is all over and everything's got settled down, and I hope to meet each one of you. I know a lot of you brethren here, hunters and fishers, you know the Indian prayer. When it's all over, I hope way down along the big game trails down to glory that we run across one another again. While we're struggling down through there, they're endless. They'll never stop. And any man who loves the woods and things like you people here in Oregon should do, right here in a beautiful spot of the world, there's a great big game trail over there that just don't end. I'll be looking for you down along the road somewhere. I'll see you there by the grace of God. And our sisters... I'd imagine seeing someone down around the springs down there, them bubbling up. See our lovely sisters down there that sitting down rubbing the mane of a lion or a tiger or something. There'll be nothing to harm there. You might sit there a million years and you'll have no less time than you did when you first come there. It'll be glorious when we get there. I'm longing for that day. Today I'm struggling, trying, pulling, pressing, crying, rebuking everything that I can do because I want to see everybody there. I'm just trying with all my heart. My sponsors, how I appreciate them, man. Only God alone knows how I appreciate them. Of course they understand. 
that I know what they've gone through. I pray for them, and not only now, but I'll constantly pray for them. They went through a great battle. Man that will do that to bring in something that they believe to be of God to encourage their people in church, I got respects for them. They belong to probably different organizations. Maybe some belong to the Assemblies of God, some the Church of God, some the Independents, and some all one thing and another. But we are together. We are brothers. I've got some children. When I go to get ice cream for them kids, I tell you, one says, bring me a vanilla. Others said, bring me a chocolate. Others said, bring me strawberry. When I come back, I look like I got the rainbow. <laughs> And I see all the different colors. But you know what? They're all my children. They're all eating ice cream. The taste doesn't matter. You know what I mean, don't you, brethren? The taste doesn't count. We're eating ice cream. We believe the same God, the same experience. And you know, after all, rainbows are coming. <laughs> That's right. So we have covered in our hearts to be brethren working together to the kingdom of God and to the glory of God. Long may you wave that banner of his glory, brother. May God ever be with you. When the hours are dark and hard, I'll be praying for you and you'll be praying for me. Still saining until we meet at the other side. Our little chairman brother there, I thought when I first heard his name, I said, he must be Italian. Come to find out, he's a Russian. And when I was up in Finland and having a meeting, I was right on the Russian border. Now listen, when people tell you, not saying that about this precious brother here, you know what he is, he lives here with you. But everybody tells you, and we hear a lot of propaganda, that Russia is all communist, and you go in there, don't you believe that nonsense? There's millions of Christians in Russia. Why, you know what? Russia, there's only 1% of Russia in the whole. It's communist. That's government statistics. 1%. What Russia needs is a revival. They need man of God to stand out with something real. When that little boy was raised from the dead in Finland, which was told two years before here he's going to raise from the dead. When that little boy was raised from the dead and he's taking me into the Helsinki, going down through there, and they had, I've always, only auditorium I was ever in before. Since then, it's got the alphabet, only they seated about, I think, 25, 30,000. And they let one group come in, let me speak to them, then turn them all out and bring another group, fresh group in. When I was coming down the the way I noticed little Finnish soldiers is right after the war that they had had with Russia, and they'd certainly got uh, a lot of their men was killed off. And them little boys, some of them so young, they never shaved, slick face, them great big old boots on, them big old knives, and hanging on their side, they'd come down the street, and they'd have me in between them. And I passed down there, the communist soldiers. Now, I don't have to take anybody's word for this. I was there. The communist soldiers, when I passed by, would stand there at that Russian salute, tears rolling down their cheeks. They said, we'll receive a God like that that can raise the dead. It went all through Russia. The thing of it is, what made Russia communist is because of the weakness of the Catholic Church there that took all the money from the people and give them nothing back and they didn't live any different lives and everything else. That's what's turning the whole world to be communist. That's right. When they see something real, they're ready to step out and receive it. I've seen Russian communist soldiers put his arm around a Christian Finnish soldier and pat him on the back. Listen, brother, anything will make a Russian and a Finn hug one another will settle wars forever. Christ is the answer to every problem. But it's, to them, it's got to be real. Never forget that night, a little Finnish girl. I, they took me into the dormitory, and such as it was, and I didn't know the little thing. And her picture's in the book back there. And so she had had one leg about four or five inches short of the other, and she had a big shoe built up beneath it. 
She had a, a brace around her here and a strap in the end of her bad foot, one across her shoulder, and she had two crutches. And she'd just come out of the ladies' restroom when I was going through and these little Finnish soldiers coming in. I was remarking, trying to talk to them, pointing my finger to them Russians there, how they were respecting deity. And so when we got inside, this little woman, little girl come out of the ladies' restroom. They'd been saying, don't nobody touch. I like kids. And I'd get all of them of afternoon when the brethren was holding the meetings and they'd all get in. I'd get some of that finished money and get out there. I had a grove of kids all the way up and down the street buying them candy. I, I like kids. And so this little girl had stepped out. She thought she'd done wrong. She stepped out where I was and she stopped. And she held her head down, a little ragged looking hair and her little skirts ragged. I learned later that she was a little Finnish orphan. She had no father or mother. And so she, they'd been killed in the war. And when she seen me, I was going in this way, and she was standing on that side, and she ducked her little head down, and I stopped. The two soldiers behind me motioned on, and there's already singing, only believe, but I just waited. I know that kid wanted something. And she looked over to me again, raised up her little face, and looked. I couldn't speak her language, so I motioned my finger to her. She come over there, where I was at. When she started, the way she'd have to walk, she'd set these two crutches out, take her little shoulder and raise up that foot and set it out like that. Then walk, then raise her little shoulder up and set that crippled foot out. I thought I'd just watch that child. It's amazing to watch children. And I watched her and she kept getting closer, closer, closer. I just stood still and them soldiers just turned around to watch. And when uh, she got real close to me, she stopped, she looked at me, and she took her little hand and reached down, picked up my coat, kissed the pocket of my coat. Let it down. I just watched her. She looked up and the tears standing in her little eyes. And she took her little crutches and held herself and pulled her little skirt out, which is very finished. Said, Kitas. That means thank you. I looked at her and I thought, if I'd be the biggest hypocrite in the world, God would answer that child's faith. I started to turn. I see her going in a vision, walking away from me. Normal. I turned around and I said, sweetheart. And she kept saying, Kitas. She couldn't hear a word I said. I said, oh, honey, Jesus Christ makes you well. She said, Kitas, Kitas. And they kept pushing me. I said, well, someday she'll find it out. After they had a great, big, long prayer line, crutches and things piled everywhere, the Lord revealing the, to the people and calling them out to the audience. My brother said, you've had enough now. We've got to preach again tomorrow. So he come to get me, and I said, just call a, just a few more cards. And when he did, the next one on the platform was that little girl. She had, she had her crutches. I said to Mrs. Isaacson, and she may be sitting here today. I said, Mrs. Isaacson, just say what I say. I said, honey, out there in the hall, Jesus made you well. Have some of the ministers take that brace off of you. Watch what happens. And when they went over there to take it off, I prayed for about another person. And here she come with both legs just as normally she could be, her hands up in the air, glorifying God. For as I know the little thing lives in Finland today, because children, children's amazing, aren't they? The simplicity of faith. I've got two little girls. They're getting big now. And uh, they're still my girls. I used to tell a little story about one time I was waiting. Mother was for me to come home. I'd been out on a meeting and the little girls was waiting up with me. For me, rather. And so... The sandmen come along, they got sleeping about one o'clock, mother put them to bed and the plane was late. And I got in and I was too tired to rest. Like last night I couldn't even sleep at all. So I just got up about, laid down for about two hours. I got up and went out in the living room, sat down in a chair. And I always made a parable out of it. Rebecca is my oldest daughter. Little Sharon went home to, with her mother, you know, years ago. But Rebecca is my oldest. She's four years older than Sarah. And Sarah was then about a four year, oh, about two years old, I guess. And Becky was about six years old. So Becky, to me, represented the church that's been here a long time. She was long-legged and skinny. And Sarah is a little bitty, hot, brown-eyed, chubby. And so, I don't know, I guess your children's like mine the hand-me-downs as close as it comes down. So Sarah was wearing out 
Becky's pajamas, and they were too big for her. They had them rabbit feet pajamas, you know, in them days. And so they were quite too big for Sarah. So that morning after it got daylight, well, I'm, the first thing you know, uh, I heard a noise. Somebody turned over back in the other room, the children, and Rebecca woke up. She realized, Daddy must be home. And out of the bed she come as hard as she could. That woke Sarah up. Sarah tried to follow her. Becky could outrun her. She was longer laid. So she run and jumped to straddle my leg, throw both arms around my neck and begin to holler, Daddy, Daddy. And little Sarah coming with them Becky's long-footed pajamas. <laughs> and she was stumbling and she was too short. She couldn't keep up with Becky. So, and Becky turned around and looked at Sarah coming down the hall. And she said, Sarah, my sister, I want you to know one thing. She said, I was here first. And I've got all of Daddy, and there's none of him left for you. You know, like some of them try to tell us today, they think they got it all. You know. They've been here a long time, started four or five hundred years ago, you know. And poor little Sarah, her little lip dropped down, her little brown eyes colored up, she started to turn around. I looked over to one side while Becky had her head against me like this. I motioned like that and stuck the other knee out. Here she come, jumped right up on, she's... She was, her legs wouldn't reach the floor. She hadn't been around very long, you know, so she, she was kind of tottering. And uh, I was afraid she was going to fall. So I just reached and tucked both arms and put them around Sarah. And she put her little head up against me like this. She turned around, rolled those big dark eyes and looked up to Rebecca and said, Rebecca, my sister, I've got something to say to you. She said, it may be so that you've got all a daddy. But I want you to know that Daddy's got all of me. So, <laughs> so I think if we just turn ourselves loose and worship the Lord, we may get a little tottery as long as He's got all of me. That's all I care for. If I can just surrender myself so completely that He can have all of me. I might not know all the ins and outs, know how to duel the creeds and so forth like that. But one thing, a fellow said to me one time, I made a remark, and he said, a very brilliant man. And he said, you just don't know your Bible. I said, but I know the author real well. <laughs> so that's a, uh, to know him is life. Don't you think so? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, if I know him, he'll reveal his book to me just as he wants me to know it. The brethren told me just there that she'd taken an offering for me. I appreciate it. Really, I didn't come for that. Uh, but I appreciate it. I always request if all expenses is made and everything, and they take up an offering, then you know what I do with that? I take it to the foreign fields myself. And I know you give a portion you're living. Now it's in my hands. I'm responsible now. It's all for your hands. But by the best of my ability, I'll use it to the kingdom of God and the upbuilding of the kingdom. I pray that it'll return to you a thousandfold. You set this hot building. You've sponsored the meeting. You've, you've done everything well. I thank you. There's not a, nothing I can do but say this. God bless every one of you. I hope he does. With all that you have need of in this journey, and I'm sure he will. I want to ask you a question and a favor. I'm fixing to leave right away now. Maybe my, I have about, I've got to go to Brother Leeming. Many of you all know him down in Florida. And there I'm with the Christian businessman at a couple meetings. And then I'm heading overseas. Or you can't sit like this. Witch doctor standing there challenging. Everything, you, you just, you're not on the battlefield here, but you are there. And when everything's going real hard and everything, can I depend on my people, friends in Oregon praying for me? Will you do that? Just pray for me. I'll be depending on you. I'll always pray for you. And if I never see you no more, this side of the river, I'll see you on the other side with the same testimony, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe he's the Son of God that still saves from sin. He suffered on a Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, rose the third day, and ever living to make intercessions upon our confession. I believe that he lives. I want to take this time to thank the, the man, the captain or general or whoever it was, and let us have this fine building. I appreciate it. 
trusting that God will richly bless this unit of whatever it is that let us have this, may there not be one of them lost. May every one of them appear with the saints of God at that day. My sincere prayer. Thank you, gentlemen. And I trust to God with all my heart that everything will go well for you through life's journey. And now, I hope someday to return, God willing, my brother's willing to do it, to return to the meeting here where we can have an extended meeting. I'd like to have a time where I could talk with my pastor brothers of the morning and, and talk about the things of the Lord. Thanks to this nice lady here that's played the organ and the pianist. We thank you, all the ushers, everything. God ever be with you. Now, this afternoon, we're going to pray for every person. And I don't want to keep you long. I've kept you long each night. I would say, forgive me, but brother, sister, somehow, keeping the message just as simple as I could, I know that seed has been planted. It'll bring forth in its season. And you pray for me as I go along. I'll always be praying and asking God to help you. I want to read one verse out of this blessed old Bible this afternoon for our text. Not speaking long, because we've got to pray for all the sick. Do you love him? Say amen. amen. Do you believe him? Say amen. amen. How many of you ever heard the little amen song? Oh, sure. That's good. That's fine. I love that. Amen. Brother Epp sings it so well. I want to read out of St. John, 14th chapter and the 8th verse alone. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. Maybe I read the next verse. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou knowest me not, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? I would like to take this text, <clears throat> show us the Father, and it will suffice us. In other words, it means satisfy us. If you show me the Father, it will satisfy us. Now that's been the cry of the human heart through all ages is to see God. Job of old cried out, if I only, in his distress, if I only knew where he lived, if I could go knock on his door and speak to him. Every man has wanted to know God and to see God. Job wanted to see him. Moses wanted to know who that was in the burning bush. And then he said, show me your glory. He wanted to see some manifestation to know that it was God. And all of us do that. We all long to see something that's real, some, something to prove that God is. And it's to my humble way of thinking that it pleases the Father to show Himself, to manifest Himself. He loves His children. How I like to tell my children uh, something and make a requirement and then see those children live right up to that, and I can show them something good. How I tell my little boy, Joseph, if you'll just be a good boy now, and, and mine, Mother, you know, Saturday, when I get back, I'm going to take you fishing. And to see that little boy, his mother say, he was just as obedient, Bill, as he could be this week. I'm happy to go show that little boy, take him fishing. I like to show him that I want to be kind to him because he's part of me. I want, I want him to be uh, like I want to be, a Christian. And I love to manifest what I want him to be through myself. And God wants to manifest himself to his children. But he asks one requirement is all. If thou wilt believe. That's all he asks. Gives his word and asks if you will believe it. Now, I'm going to speak. Now, yet wasn't it strange here that Philip, that great warrior who had seen those great mighty works of Christ, went and got Nathaniel and brought him up there to the place and saw the manifestation of the scriptural proof that he was the Messiah. And then he said, 
Now you show us the Father, and it'll satisfy. Now, did you notice the, the next verse, the ninth verse? said, I have been so long with you, Philip, and you know me not. How I think that would be for us this afternoon, that God in his mercy has manifested himself so many times to us, and yet we don't recognize it. Now, I'm going to speak on four ways to see God. Now, a lot of people try to place him way off as a historical affair, but let's just look at God in four ways. And I think that if God can be shown positive without one shadow of doubt, that God in four different ways is standing right here this afternoon that ought to be convincing, aren't we? Four ways of seeing God. I'm going to speak of God in his universe, God in his word, God in his son, and God in his people. And I, I could take a dozen more, but those four things I want to rest upon for the next 30 minutes, God willing. Let's take first now. God in his universe. Who made the universe? We're told that it stands in space. How can it revolve around so perfect, more perfect than any instrument? I'm wearing a $300 watch that was given to me by Dr. Guckenbuehl in Switzerland. He gave it to me because it's got an alarm for interviews and so forth. And it's uh, the Balkan Cricket. One of the best that Swiss makes. But yet... It'll lose time, gain time. It isn't perfect. Anything that man makes is imperfect. But all that God does is perfect. See? Notice how he can make that world turn just around the sun, ever exact, gaining so much year after year, day after day, moving around the equator, moving around its orbit, and everything and make those stars and things so they can predict the eclipse of the moon 20 years away to the minute. So perfect. And what's holding it up? Which is up and down? How do we know? Them on the south pole to us is looking that way saying it's up. And we on the north pole is looking this way and that's down to south pole. Which is right. How perfect it folks. Spin anything in the air and see if it'll stand there. Two revolutions without moving out of its orbit. But God perfectly holds the whole universe in his control. We believe that, that God does that. No other power, nothing else could do it but God, God alone. And did you ever go out here at the sea, watch that big angry sea, those big white waves dashing in there, angry? You know, almost four-fifths of the earth is covered in water. And one time it covered the whole earth over. How it would like to get a pass there if it could. But you notice, it'll just come so far. Why? God's got a watchdog watching it. That's the moon. The moon controls. God set it there to control the sea. If that moon would ever move a few uh, inches out of its orbit, the whole world would be covered with water just in a moment. Watch when he turns his head to see what the other side of the earth is in the evening, when or the mornings and so forth, how the tide goes out. And here it comes in angrily again, but the watchdog there says, that's your boundaries. Stay right there. And yet there's enough water out there with the curvature of the earth to wash the whole thing around. But God has a control. Hey, man. Oh, how great thou art. How great thou art. How he does it, how he, uh, it's beyond our mean. How we could spend hours on that. Let's drop down to something else. Let's watch the flowers, how they live, die, raise again. How that you could take your grass in the wintertime and pour a slab of concrete across it. Where is the most grass the next summer? Right around the edge of the wall. Why is it? It's that life. It's you hid under that concrete, but when that Botany, controller, sun, S-U-N, begins to shine. You can't hide that life. It'll come right out and weave its way out and stick its head right up to the glory of God. Is that right? You can't hide life. No matter, you can bury him in the sea. You can, wherever you are, you're going to answer anyhow. When the S-O-N comes, the Son of God, all eternal life is going to rise with him. 
because he has eternal life and gives it to those who he will. And now, notice how God lives in the flower, how he lives in the leaves on the tree, how they'll drop off, go down the sap well into the root, some intelligence controlling it, going down to the root to hide through the winter, come back again in the spring, bringing forth fruit and so forth. How does it do it? Beyond my knowing, what has got to be an intelligence somewhere that controls it? It can't do it itself. There's nothing to say to that peach tree out there, that pear tree. Say, it's coming on wintertime, around about the middle of August. All you leaves, get off of there right quick. Life, jump down in the roots and hide. If you don't, you'll die. It don't know what to do it itself. It's some intelligent controls it. The highest intelligence that there is. God. Well, if God can tell a leaf, the life of that leaf, to leave it and go down there and stay, or a life to come out of the upper part of the tree and go into the roots, can he reveal the secrets of the hearts of the people to his servants? The intelligence of God? Well, the whole thing's made up of intelligence. God is the super intelligence. Look at the ducks, the, the animals, how they're all controlled by God. Recently, my son and I were in Bombay to a meeting. When we got there, I was reading a newspaper. It's a bilingual country, and so it had it in English. and said, I guess the earthquakes are over. A few days before that, you know, India's not like our country. We have fine woven fences. They pick up rocks and make their fences. And they build their towers and so forth. It's very hot, close to the, the zones there, you know, and the equator. So the, the sheep and the cattle in the afternoon come and stand around these walls and they get in the, the shade and the little birds build their nest in the walls and one day something happened all the little birds took off no one knew why got away from them walls went out didn't know where they went set in the trees somewhere they wouldn't come back to their nest and the cattle wouldn't come in everyone said what's the matter them cattle, them sheep, standing out there, leaning against one another in that hot sun way out in the middle of the field. They wouldn't come in. They wondered why. And the next day, it did the same thing. And the third day, they did the same thing. Then an earthquake shook the place into pieces. The walls fell. The cattle and sheep had been standing there that had died. The little birds had been crushed. The next day, nothing happened. And then on the fifth day, then the little birds and things begin to come back again. The earthquake was over. Don't you see? It's the same God that could lead them into the ark in the days of Noah. Is the same God who can take them away from danger. Well, if God, by the instinct, he gives to a bird to know to flee away from fallen walls, how much more ought we to flee away from these big, high ecclesiastical walls that's bound to crush by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Get away. Go to God quickly. Don't put your name on a book. Get born again. Fill with the Holy Ghost. God in nature. God give that little bird nature. He believes in it. He, he trusts it. Here not long ago, I was up in Canada. And there was them ducks up there. Up there on the pond, how are they milling around on the pond? They'll be there now in about, Lord willing, in about another month, I take a hunting trip there. That little ducks come out of the south, way down in Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, the rice fields, and they fly all the way into Canada, and they have their little ducklings up there on those marshes, swamps, or, or lakes. Now here's a little drake. He was born right down that lake, born that spring. He's never been off of that pond. That's all he knows, born right there. But one night, there'll come a, a white cap across the mountain up there. There'll be snow strike that mountain. That cold breeze will sweep down through the valley. That little drake will get right out there in the middle of that pond, stick that little honker up in there and honk four or five times, and every duck on the pond will come right to him. Why? He'll raise right off of that pond and go without a compass or anything else just as straight to Texas as he can go to the rice fields. 
If he stays any longer, it'll freeze over. They'll die. He's never been off of there. How does he know where to go? He trusts in the God-given instinct. And if a duck has got sense enough to get away from danger and coldness, how much ought the church, by the power of the Holy Ghost and the resurrection of Christ, to get away from a dying creed? See what I mean? Instinct. One time I was plowing, Papa and I, the horses kept snorting, and I said, Pop, what's the matter? Is there a coyote back there? He said, no, son's coming, a storm. I said, a storm? I was on an old riding cultivator. Many of you know what they are. He said, a storm? I said, it was not a cloud nowhere. He said, stop. Never will get the old fella. Pulled out his red handkerchief and wiped the perspiration from his brow. He said, Billy, you got a lot to learn, son. He said, you see, the Almighty has given that horse an instinct so he can go to safety. He said, there's a storm coming somewhere and they can smell that storm. I thought, Daddy... I said, all right. And I hadn't plowed two more rounds so we could hardly get the, the horses out quick enough. Lightning, thundering and everything, and here was a storm. They caught it before it got there. And if God can give a horse, talk about horse sense, can give a horse instinct and intelligence enough to know how to protect itself from danger, how much more ought we by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to flee in safety when we see a time like this arriving? Yes. Show us the Father. It will suffice us. Oh, my. How I could dwell on that. You take an old sow hog and she's got her shucks over on the north side of the hill. And you read the commentator, uh, news commentator on the radio or in the paper, says tomorrow it's going to be a fair, pretty day. And that old sow takes them shucks off that north side of the hill, around to the south side of the hill. You watch, she knows more about it than all the newspapers and commentaries in the world. You watch it turn cold. You watch when you go to hunt rabbits and see them getting way back under the brush piles and things like that and getting a hiding place and setting back in the holes. And the commentator says, it's going to be fair weather. Don't you believe that? That rabbit knows more about it than all them guys put together. He's trusting a God-given instinct. It's God making a way for his creation. And how much higher is a creation of a man than a creation of a beast? How much more is the Holy Ghost to the church? Then instinct would be to a duck or a horse or anything. I could take two hours on it. One more thing I'd like to strike. That's where I first found God. That was my first Bible. To see there had to be something to do these things. God is in his universe. How I love sunsets. Stand and watch the sunset and cry. Watch it raise and cry. I love it. I made a remark last night about being a hunter. I like to hunt. I've hunted since I was a little boy. I've hunted the world over, Africa, Indian, everywhere. Many of you know of Bud Branham in the Rainy Pass Lodge of Anchorage, Alaska, 16 planes flying in. That's my cousin. Come from a line of hunters. And we love it. It's right in us. We love to hunt. Now, I used to go up in Colorado where I herd cattle up there for a long time on a ranch. And there, bringing them roundups in and out, Mr. Jeffries may be sitting right here this afternoon. He just lives right over here in Idaho now. And... So he and I used to go up there together and hunt, hunt elk. I loved to hunt them. We had about 80 in a herd back there. We just took one each year for what we needed. The herd built big. So therefore, Mr. Jeffrey's a real woodsman. He knowed how to hunt. He knowed all the ins and outs. I'd help salt the cattle and drive them in there and round them up and so forth. I knowed every angle back over on the Continental Divide. Coming around where he crossed Berthoud Pass, go down there, cross Rabbit Ear Pass, the Continental Divide comes in a panoramic. The Troublesome River feeds down this way, and the Hereford Association grazes this valley, and there's the East and West Forks. We go up the East Fork, tie horses and separate and come plumb down the West Fork, miles and miles and miles away. Maybe I see one another for several days, hunting. One year I was up there hunting. I'd get way up as high as I could climb, sit there of the evening when the sun goes down, and oh my, you talk about God. <laughs> I was up there one day, it was dry, the elk hadn't come down yet, not enough snow and stuff to bring them down. They're a wild critter, they stay high, because they don't want to get down around civilization, it takes snow and stuff to drive them down sometimes. Then when I was up there walking around, 
looking and a tie of horse way down that morning, went from up around the timber line, making a big circle coming down what we call Lost Canyon and down through that way. No tenderfoot gets in there. Oh, it's too far for him. So way back in there, I was walking and I had my rifle and I was walking along there and it come up a, a storm. You know how it is high in the mountains? It'll storm and then snow and then melt off and the wind will blow and the sun will shine. All kinds of weather in October up there. It's changing all the time. So it hadn't had enough snow to drive them down. So I was near the timber line and I got into a blowdown where a hurricane had twisted up the timber and blowed it together. And I was climbing through this and it come a great heavy storm, raining. And I got back behind a tree and I stood like this behind the tree till the storm was over and I was standing there almost went to sleep. The wind's blowing and things. Now, you could hear God speaking through the roar of them pines. I thought, oh God, how great thou art. And after the storm was over, I stood there a little bit kind of naughty. I almost fell over two or three times, got a little wet. So I been awful hard blow, and I walked out behind, I thought, glory to God, how wonderful it is to be up here, to be alone with God. Two days now, I haven't seen nobody. You're so hundred, you're 40 miles anyhow from a railroad. You're way away from automobiles, no gasoline, cigarettes, all stinking carry on of what's called civilization. I thought, this is wonderful to be standing here. I watched the sun setting over here in Oregon, across that way, and there's great, big, pretty eye setting through there, and I thought, that's right. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. You can see God anywhere if you'll just look around. He's all around you, everywhere. He's in flowers, nature, everywhere. I seen him there. Then I happened to look, and I heard an old coyote hollering up on the hill there. His mate answered him down the bottom. Now you talk about deep calling to the deep. Hear that squall of the coyote or timber wolf? That just sets my soul aflame. I hear him over hollering. He lost his mate. She answered him way down at the bottom, and I thought, oh, God, I got a mate, too. Yeah. I'll call, and he'll answer me one day. Amen. I stood there, and I thought, God, there you are. I heard the bugle over here, the elk herd I was trying to catch up with. Big old male let out that long whistle bugle like that. What the storm had separated the elk up high, and he had lost his herd, and he was calling for him. I thought, oh, God, you live up here. That's right. Here you are. There he was in the elk herd. There he was in the call of the wolf. Then I happened to look, and where the sun come out and the evergreens had froze that cold wind, there was a rainbow across the canyon. I said, there he is in the rainbow. Amen. Amen. There he is. There is the covenant. He'll never destroy it again with water. He promised it. And a rainbow also is the Revelations 1, where over the Son of God and over the church, the seven golden candlesticks was a rainbow. He used to look upon it, Jasper and Sardis stone, the first and the last, he that was, which is, and shall come. Oh, my, my, my. Everywhere you look, you can see God if you just open up your eyes. Look around. He's everywhere. And I was standing there, and all at once, the little old pine squirrel. How many of you Oregon people know what they are? He's a blue coat policeman of the woods. But all noise and no squirrel. <laughs> he jumped up on there and went, chatter, 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 chatter. And I thought, what's the matter with you, little fella? I'm not going to hurt you. So then the rainbow, I looked at it again. And I said, glory to God. And around and around the tree I went. This is hard as I go shouting. And he just looked at me and just chatter, chatter, chatter. I thought, did I excite you? I'm worshiping your creator. You don't like that? Let me show you how it's done again. Around her tree, over again. If they'd have thought they had somebody out there out of the insane institution, I guess, if somebody was, I didn't care. I was worshiping God. I saw him. I heard him everywhere. You can see him if you'll just look around. He's real. And I was around around that tree as hard as I could go and praising God and throwing up my hands and hollering hallelujah, stomping the ground around and around the tree, went again like an insane person. But I was having a letting off a lot of steam. <laughs> I was having a good time. I thought, oh, it's good to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's just stay up here. A wonderful place to be in the presence of God in his universe. Watch him in his universe. His sunset, his rainbow, the call of the elk. Here, everywhere, there's God. And I thought, you little snickle fritz, why did you interrupt me from worshiping? And my God, I see him sitting on this stump or a place where the tree would blow down, going chatter, 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 little tail drawn up under him like that. Chatter, 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 chatter. I thought, what's the matter with you? You, you think I'm acting funny? But I noticed him, he's cocking his little head down, his eye bugged out, looking down in that brush. He wasn't hollering at me at all. The wind had blown an eagle down in there. One of the big old brown eagles in Colorado. 
And he was, that eagle would pick him up, you know. So he, he was afraid of that eagle. He wasn't paying no attention to me, but he's afraid of that eagle. That big eagle jumped up there and I thought, my, now I see you out there, God. I see you, hear you down there, hearing the call, see you all around everywhere, see you in the sky, see you in the rainbow, see you everywhere. But now, I wonder if you could be in that eagle. Why did he interrupt my worship for? And I watched that eagle for a little bit. I thought, now I've seen his big gray eyes look at me and he looked over at that little old pine squirrel and then look at me. And I admired him because he was brave. He wasn't afraid. I hate a coward. I hate somebody to not hate the person, but the attitude that they can stand in church and shout like the rest of them and go outside and when a real showdown comes, you're ashamed to say you're a Pentecostal. You're ashamed to admit you got healed by divine healing. Oh, God can't use something like that. He wants soldiers. He wants somebody that can say like Paul, in the way that's called heresy. That's the way I worship the God of our fathers. Amen. He wants soldiers. Backbone, not wishbone. He wants somebody that's got spunk enough and spirit enough to stand up. I said, yes, I see God in an eagle. He's not afraid. He's not a bit scared. I thought I'll just see how afraid he is. I said, say, fella, you know I could shoot you? One of my voice rang out. He looked at me real close and rolled on big eyes. I began to see him feeling them feathers, you know, with his straightening them out. I thought, there you are. There you are. God give him two wings yeah. to get away from trouble, get away from danger. And he's trusting those wings. Yeah. Yeah. He's God given escape. He feels them wings is all in running order. All right. Someone said to me one time, Brother Brian, if you're afraid you make a mistake up there and you're afraid something will happen up there. Oh, no, as long as everything's in running order. Amen. It's all right. Don't worry. He's going to give the promise. This old eagle fooling his wings, messing them up and down like that. I thought, oh, yeah, there you are. And I reached to grab my gun. He jumped and looked at me like that and kept his eye right on me. Now, he knowed by his ability that he could take those wings and get in that timber before I could get that side on him. He knew that. And he trusted it, so he wasn't afraid. Why should we be afraid? No matter what comes along. Amen. God, give us the Holy Ghost. Yes. Lord, I am with thee always, even to the end of the world. Amen. What are we scared about? God calls you before the foundation of the world. Put your name on the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Your name was put on the book before the foundation of the world. The Bible said so. Amen. The Bible said the Antichrist in the last days would deceive all that dwelt upon the earth whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life since yes. the foundation of the world. Not the last revival, but the foundation of the world. There you are. So you know you're living above. You're in something. You've received the Holy Ghost. What are you scared of? Hey, man, God in his universe. I believe it, don't you? Yeah. I watched that fellow there for a few minutes. That little chipmunk sitting there going, or a little chip, that's what we call them home. They're little, actually a little pine squirrel. He's going, chatter, 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 chatter. That eagle got enough of it. He just didn't want to fool with him anymore. So he just made a great big bounce like that, flopped his wings about two times, and he is above the timber. He just set his wings. He didn't flop anymore. He just set his wings. And every time the wind would come in, he'd rise higher. The wind would come in, he'd rise higher. Not moving a feather. He just knew how to set his wings. I watched him. I dropped my gun. I looked at him. He got smaller, smaller, until he got come out of sight. I thought, oh God, that's it. That's it. It's not join this one and take your papers from this and over here, join this, join this, join that, run through one prayer line, or will come through, go through his and go through another and go through another. That's not it. It's just knowing how to set your wings of faith in the power of his resurrection. And when the Holy Ghost comes in, right up above it, right above that chipmunk sitting there, days of miracles is past, no such a thing as divine healing that earthbound creature. We are eagles. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost comes in and we ride out of the way of danger, plumb till it becomes so we don't even hear it no more. Days of miracles is past. No such a thing as divine healing. It's mental telepathy. There's something wrong. Our church would do this. We got the biggest. We are the greatest organ. Just ride on above it. 
Just set your wings and say, Jesus Christ, I love you. I trust you. And hold this blessed old two-winged book here and just fly away. Hallelujah. Amen. For he's the same yesterday. Day and for Amen. Amen. God in his universe. You believe he's in his universe? See him in his birds. See him everywhere. We'll have to leave right quick from that subject to get the rest of them. We stay all afternoon on God in his universe. Now let's say God in his word. How many believe that God's in his universe? Raise your hand. All right. You believe now God is in his universe. Now let's take God in his word. Now the Bible said, Jesus said, that the word was a seed that a sower sowed. Is that right? Now you people here in Oregon, when you sow your crops, what does it do? You don't have to go out every morning and dig it up. If you, sow, you plant a crop of corn, and every morning you go out and dig it up, look at it and say, well, is it, I don't see a thing going on. It never will grow. You can't, you can't dig it up. You've got to commit it to the ground. Yes. That's the place for it. Every time you dig it up, you delay it. Listen to me, I'm going to say something big. <laughs> Every time that you look at your symptoms, you're delaying your healing. Yes. Don't dig it up again. It's committed to him that promised to heal. Hallelujah. Him that heals the rest of them. When you pass through the prayer line and the hands is laid upon you, the Bible said the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Don't say, well, let's see if I feel any better. My heart any better. My hands. Don't do that. You're delaying it. Commit it to the ground because it is a seed. What does a seed do? Look at a little look at a little little apple tree out here. You people raise a lot of apples. Look at a little apple tree. When it's no more than what we call in the East a sprig, a little tree about like that. Did you know that every apple will ever be on that tree is in it right then? Yes. If it isn't, where did it come from? Where did it come from? And that apple tree that's got going to produce you hundreds of bushels of apples. Where do they come from? When you set that little plane out about like that, just out of an apple seed, and set it out there, and every apple that'll ever be on there, it's got in it then potentially every hundred bushel of apples that you collect off of it in a half inch high. Yes. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. There you are. Where does it come from? It's in the apple then. And when you are planted into his death, burial, and resurrection, yes. planted in Christ, and receive his Holy Spirit life in you, everything that you've got need of all the way through the journey is in you right then. For you become the seed. See it? God in his word. Now what does a tree have to do? When you plant it, the only thing you have to do is water it. And then it's got to drink. The leaves are in it. The apples are in it. The, everything's right in the tree. But it's got to drink. It's got to drink more than its potion. And as it drinks, it pushes out. Pushes out leaves. Pushes out blossoms. Pushes out apples. But it's got to keep drinking. 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 In order to push out. And when we take a promise of God, drop it into our heart, we keep watering it with faith. And it keeps pushing out, pushing out. Amen. Hallelujah. When Christ is planted in the heart, the Holy Hallelujah. Ghost, only thing we do is drink in this Word of God, and it pushes out salvation, it pushes out divine healing, it pushes out glory, it pushes out everything that we have need of is Amen. right in us when we're planted in Christ Jesus. Amen. Here's my interpretation of Him about being the water. He is the inexhaustible fountain of life. You'll never ask him too much. You can never believe him for two greater things. He delights in you believing him for great things. You can never overdo it. Could you imagine a little fish about a half inch long, way out there in the middle of that ocean, saying, now wait a minute, I better think this thing over. I better drink very sparingly of this water because I might run out this year. <laughs> well, if you could figure that out, then try to exhaust the fountain of God's goodness to you. Could you just imagine a little mouse about a half inch long under the big garners of, of, of Egypt saying, I'll just eat one grain a day. I better allowance myself to one grain a day because I might run out before the new crop comes in. 
My, what's he doing? He's depriving himself. That's exactly what's the matter with the church today and taking church creeds and dogmas and trying to suck off of them instead of taking the Word of God and enjoying the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the things of God. Why? His Word is a seed. And this Word brings forth of its kind. Now, we've just passed a great revival. Swept the land. Fifteen years until it went on. What have we reaped out? We reaped out a bunch of new members. Yeah, why? That's what kind of seed we sowed. Remember, the rain falls up on the earth to water, dress it for which it's prepared for. And now remember, if you had a field of wheat out here and it was growing, its little heads is hanging over. When you see anything too sturdy, it's self style A heavy, full head always bows. Yes. I hope you got that. So now notice. Now, got a little weed standing there and it's a drought on them. People are praying for rain. Well, that little wheat's going, it just can't, it just can't hardly get along any longer. It's going to die. The little wheat is just as happy to get water as it would be. God sends the rain. And you know what? When the rain falls, that little wheat straightens up and goes, glory to God. It just shouts the praises of God because it comes to life. And the same water makes the weed grow. Just as happy can shout just as loud. Now, that's what Jesus said. If you want to read it, Hebrews 6 chapter. I haven't got time to go into it because it's getting away from us. The rain cometh off upon the earth. Jesus said the rain falls on just and unjust. We can see people shouting, speaking in tongues, dancing in the Spirit, everything like that. That don't mean yet they got it. Oh, no, I've seen many of them do it and didn't have it. But by their fruits you shall know them. Fruit, the Holy Spirit, believing God's Word and manifesting God's Word. That leads us to the next thought. God in His Son. You believe God is in His Word? How we go here, I got a dozen scriptures wrote out here about how God manifests through Abraham, through different ones like that, proving that He was. But let's squeeze. How many believe God's in His Word? Frankly, He is the Word. Now, God in His Son. You believe God was in His Son? He was the manifestation. He said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. If I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. How many times this week we've went through that uh, back and forth to show that He was the Word. So you see, nature, Word, Son, it's all coming to the same God. Actually, the same God working in different channels. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. He was God, the Word. Every one of us believe that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. Jesus is the Son of God that is the body. And God was the Spirit that dwelt in that tabernacle that He created for Himself. A virgin body. God, that's the reason He said here, I've been so long with you and you don't know me. He that see me has seen the Father. In other words, you see the Father working through me. God is a Spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. See? God is a Spirit. And here we find the Word being made manifest. And First John, we find it. Also in John 11, it says here that, uh, and uh, also in John 5, 24, we find many places. John 14, Jesus said that he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Why? It's a word made manifest in them. Here some time ago, I was preaching, exalting, and a woman belongs to another church. I don't like to call churches denominational names. But this woman, she belonged to a church that believed in mental healing. They believe that the, that the devil is a thought and God's a thought and your, your thoughts is whatever it is. <laughs> they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. In this day, that when people try to make Jesus just a man. Well, he was more than a man. Amen. If he's just a man, we're all lost. He was God, nothing less of God. He was God manifested in the flesh. Jehovah. The Father dwelling in His Son, reconciling the world to Himself. That's the reason we was commissioned by St. Matthew there. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. What? Not three gods, three manifestations of the same God. God the Father was a pillar of fire. He was made flesh and dwelt among us. God the Son. God above us. God with us. Now the same God, the Holy Ghost, in us. Three office, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's the same God. 
Not three gods, the one God. Made himself three offices, three manifestations. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, what a, a world we are living in. Notice, perfect. Now, when he was here on earth, so this woman said, Mr. Branham, she said, I enjoy hearing you speaking, but there's one fault I find with you. And I said, what's that? She said, you bragged too much on Jesus. Oh, I said, if that's the only fault I got, I, I sure thank you, lady, if that's all you can find wrong with me. I said, I hope God's that way when I come to meet him. And this, find, this bragging on his son too much is the only fault I had. And she said, well, you said that you were a fundamentalist. You just spoke with the Bible and you didn't put nothing. I said, that's exactly, I still say that. She said, if I can prove to you by your own Bible that he wasn't divine, you're always making him divine. I said, he, he is, if he wasn't divine, he was the biggest deceiver the world ever had. And we're all in sin. If he's just an ordinary man, then any other man could die one for the other. And he could be nothing short of God. Right. right. When he was going up Calvary that day, and them little red spots on his coat, they all went into one. The bee of death stinging around him, humming, I got him now. They just put a rag around his face and they hit him on the head. You know, he could discern the thoughts. They said, tell us who hit him, we'll believe you. They spit in his face, pulled handfuls of beard out. The devil said, I got him now. And when he's going up the hill, he said, that couldn't be God. The devil said, that can't be God. He'll never put up with nothing like that. And I can see him as he goes up his little frail body, falling like that as he staggered up the hill. That bee humming around him, that buzz of death right in his veins, knowing in a little bit he's going to be gone. That bee said, I got him now. The devil said, go on, death, get him. That's all there is. He's nothing. He's just like all the rest of them. He's going to die. You sting him right on down there and he'll die. But look, brother. When a bee ever anchors his stinger real deep, he'll never pull a stinger again. He'll have no more stinger. He'll pull the stinger out. When sting of death could come up on an ordinary man because he was a sinner, he could pull that stinger out and sting another. But that time, he anchored his stinger in Emmanuel's flesh. Amen. Hallelujah! It pulled a stinger out of death. A bee can buzz and make all kinds of noise. That old, uh, any insect that ever stings deep enough, it loses its stinger. And when death stung the Son of God, he lost his stinger. No wonder Paul could say, Death, where is your stinger? Brave, where is your victory? Sure, he was more than a man. That was Emmanuel, God with us. And she said, I'll prove to you by your Bible that he wasn't divine. I said, let's hear you do it. She said, St. John, the 11th chapter, the Bible said that when Jesus went to the grave of Lazarus, he wept. And I said, is that your scripture? She said, yes, he could not be divine and weep. I said, later, lady, you know what? That argument you've got is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken is starved to death. I said, well, you haven't got a, a room for nothing there. I said, you failed to see he was both God and man. He was a God-man. God was in him. Right. I said, let me ask you something. He went down to the grave of weeping. He was a man. He weeps with those who weeps. He's sad with those who sad. He's happy with those who full of joy. But when he went down to the grave, standing there, his little shoulders stooped down. The Bible said, there's no beauty we should desire him. Said, take ye away the stone. Straighten up them little shoulders. Lazarus, come forth. Amen. And a man had been dead four days in the grave, rotten, come to life and stood on his feet. That was more than a man. Amen. Hey, man, that was God in his son. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Man can't do that. He, I'll admit, he was a man. When he come down off the mountain that night, been up there hungry, he come down looking for something to eat, looking all around over a tree for something to eat. He was a man when he was hungry. But when he took five biscuits and two fish and fed 5,000 that was more than a man. That was God in his son. Believe it. He was a man when he laid out on the back of that ship that night. that tossed about like a bottle stopper in the storm. When 10,000 devils of the sea swore they'd drown him. He was a man laying there asleep, tired, virtue had gone from him. He was a man, but when he was aroused, walked up to the braille of the boat, put his foot on, looked up and said, Peace be still, and the winds and the waves obeyed him. That was more than a man. That was God in his son. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
He was a man crying on the cross, I thirst, give me drink. But on that third day, when he broke the seals of death, hell in the grave and rose again, he proved he was God. Amen. 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 Any man or woman that's ever mounted to a hill of beans believe that. It's thrilled the hearts of poets down to the ears. If I could call on scene today, somebody believe that. I think of Eddie Pruitt. All of you know the poet, Eddie Pruitt. No one that buys poetry. They didn't want nothing to do with it. One day he was crying and he went into his study and he said, Oh God, what can I do? And he grabbed his pen and he wrote the inauguration song. What did you say, Eddie Pruitt? Is it all hail the power of Jesus' name? Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Amen. Amen. Another one said, Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming, O oh, glorious day. Amen. God and his Son. Reconciling the world to himself. Amen. 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 Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever and someday he's coming. Oh glorious day. Hoskins wrote, when I survey the wondrous cross where on the Prince of Glory died, I count all my fame to be but lost. Amen. Lord Fanny Crosby screamed out. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, for thou, the stream of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? Amen. 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 God in his Son, do you believe he was? He looked like God. He acted like God. He said he was God. He cried like God. He healed like God. He died like a man. And he rose like God. Amen. He was God. Manifested in the flesh. God was in his son. Do you believe it? Amen. God was in his universe. You believe it? Yes. God is in his word. You believe it? Amen. God is in his son. You believe it? Because you see him in Christ. Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. Why says thou show me the Father? God was in the Son, reconciling the world, the world to Himself. Now, God in His universe, you believe it. God in His Word, you believe it. God in His Son, you believe it. Now, God in His people. Amen. Now you get Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Same God all the time. Condensing, once holy, man away from Him. He couldn't come near. Even a sheep touched the mountain or an ox must be thrust through. When He stood on top of Sinai and roared out His voice. Nothing could come near because there was no sacrifice but the animal. That was God above us. Then God condescended. He came down and we felt him. First Timothy 3.16 Without controversy, great is the mystery of God. For God was manifested in the flesh. Seen of angels, believed on, received up in the glory. We've seen God express himself through his son, Christ Jesus. Now, God above us. God with us. Now, God in us. All that God was, he poured into Christ, and all Christ was, he poured into the church. Yeah. Yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I, and I as a personal pronoun, I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the consummation. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is saying, yes, today, forever. Maybe he loved me, dying, he buried, he carried my sins far away. As and he justified freely forever. No wonder he's a root and offspring of David, the morning star. He that was, which is, and shall come. He that was dead is alive forevermore. Manifesting himself after 2,000 years proves that he's Jesus. God in his universe. God in his word. God in his love. God in his people. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Show me the Father, and it'll satisfy us. God in his people on Pentecost. God in Peter, when his shadow passed over the sick, healed him. God in Paul, that they took from his body handkerchiefs and aprons. Hallelujah. God is here today. You believe it? God, you believe he's in his universe? You believe he's in his word? You believe he's in his son? You believe he's in his people? We've watched it this week, time after time. The same works that God did through Solomon. It was God 
The same works that he did through there, he did through Jesus, his son. Yes. The same thing we've seen him do through his son, we see him do through his church. Yes. Making him the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. God in his universe, God in his word, God in his son, God in his people. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to come back sometime when I can preach as long as I want to. Hallelujah. You believe it? Show us the Father, and it will satisfy us. Just show us the Father, and it will satisfy us. How we thank the Lord that He remains God. Why we thank Him because He, he gave His only Son... His only begotten Son, that He might bring many sons into the world. That He might show Himself alive today. Jesus died. The only begotten Son of God, that He might make us adopted children. That He might work His will through us. How shameful we should be of claiming to be children of God and let the devil push us around like He does. We've got the right here already risen with Him. You say, do you have power? No, sir. We don't have any power, but we have authority. There's a lot of difference between power and authority. Christ has the power. Someone asked me a while ago, a precious brother, met me on the street. He said, Brother Branham, are you Jesus' name? I said, I'm Jesus' servant. I'm his servant. Notice, I'm going to ask you He remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Would you like him to be your Savior this afternoon? Would you like to know that this God that's close could be your Savior? If you would, raise up your hand and say, I want to accept him, Brother Branham, right where I am. I'm going to believe. God bless you. God bless you. That's good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. That's good. Up in the balconies, all around, everywhere. God bless you. That's good. Several hands went up. Oh, see, when we just get warmed into the meeting now. See, that's Satan trying to war off that old devil. You believe right now, this is the hour. This is the time to in your own church you can start a revival and do the works of God. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, he that God, he who God has sent does the works of God. Yes. Amen. Believe it now. Don't you doubt it. You have faith. Don't doubt. Be real reverent just for a minute and pray. Do you? Be real quiet now.
be to God. We all believe and believe in speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues. We believe that God does that, and He does it to edify His church. Now, if I notice the message just right, it said something about believe that the Lord would manifest Himself and do something in the, for His people. Now, right while you're sitting, for we call the prayer line. I want to ask you something. Every soul that accepted Christ, will you make this promise to me and to God, God first and then me, that everyone here that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will go to one of these good churches here and ask for Christian baptism if you haven't been baptized yet by water, and there stay until you have received the Holy Ghost and, and give your life to Christ for service. He, as many as believed, was added to the church. Is that right? How many will promise that? That's never done it. Will promise God right now by His grace, you'll do it. If you can see God manifest Himself amongst His people this afternoon, raise your hand. Say, I will do it. God bless you. Raise your hand and say, God bless you. Another one. God bless you. You, 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 you. Just look at the hands. All down here on the bottom floor now. How many? Say, if I can see God manifest Himself and prove Himself right there amongst His people, I see Him in His universe, He's in His Word, and His Son, and His Son, the same yesterday, and forever, I see the Son. Come on, actually. To the balconies over here to my left. Can I see some hands? Can I say, I promise you all that. We can any and every one promise you all that. It's not Christian. Along in this way, raise up your hand so I can see them. So God can see them. You know, you know your heart. Back in the balcony this way. I can't see back there. It's so dark. But raise your hands to God and say, I will. I will. I can see Fanny or something like that. I can't tell which it is. Back over in this way. Raise your hand. I'll be your honest. You'll do it. Raise your hand. God bless you. All around. Any more on the floor now? Down your feet. I'll raise my hand to God. God bless you, Lee. God bless you over here, sir. That's very, very fine. Someone else. Huh? God knows your heart. You mean that. Right with the thing over here tonight. Get to one of these churches here. Right there somewhere. And be baptized. Call him on the name of the Lord because remember... Do you believe that I am his servant? Raise your hands. Have I found grace in your sight this week? Raise your hands. All of you want to be honest and say, I really believe. Listen, the coming of the Lord is closer than you think. I haven't talked about it for you. Just simply staying right with the message of the day. Remember Abraham's last son. And you remember who was that went down into there Abraham's last son? Look at the same thing here in time of the Jews when they were rejected. Here it is in the Gentile sign. As I've told you all this week and laid it in close and proved to you about never in history have we ever had an evangelist on the field. Sankey Moody knocks Calvin to that whole formal church out there, the lost churches out in Sodom. They never received the Holy Ghost and been born and come out of it. But out in there, we have a wonderful messenger out there today by the name of Billy Graham. G R A H A M. I Abraham. Get it? There's a church elected. There's, look what kind of a message he went in there preached to him. Come out, come out, come out, come out. But what did this man do up here? He just showed him a sign. Yeah. With his back turned to the tent. Right. Okay. That was a church elected. Oh, don't be sleeping, friends. Then awake ye saints of the Lord. Why slumber when the end is near? Yeah. But get ready for that final call. Amen. And the call is on. Yeah. Have faith. Heavenly Father, Praise I'm your servant. I, I commit this service to you. I've preached your word the best that I know how, what little time, nervously and tired and wore out. Lord, the people's attended. Night after night, they've come back like they, they wanted to listen more. Now, God, I pray that everyone that you've called, they'll come at this meeting. Grandfather, may these churches be filled up with the people. May they come confessing their sins and being baptized, receive the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Lord. Lay your these sojourning here now. It's on their road to the promised land. They don't claim to be of this world. We are pilgrims and strangers. We profess that we're from another kingdom. We died in the old kingdom and we are raised with our king. He's a spirit living among us, working his life in us, giving us the authority to preach his word and living through us, performs his own miracles as he goes claiming and showing that the nature of his spirit when he was here on earth is still the same thing today, God in his people. Bless us now. You'll it'd be up to you, Father, to do the rest. I've preached, made the altar call, hands has went up. I've trusted him to you. 
God grant that there'll be trophies of the meeting. They'll never forget. Everywhere they look, they'll be able to see God everywhere. Grant it. Bless us together now. Now we're waiting to see you come riding in, Father, on the way. Come, like you did that night to the little troubled ship where all hopes is gone that they could ever be saved. The people were afraid of you. And he said, be not afraid, it's I. Be of a good courage. God grant it today that the people might know who has claimed you as their Savior, that they don't have to worry, you're here. The same yesterday, today, and forever. God in his people. Grant it, Father, through Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have prayer cards? Now raise up your hands. Is there any here without prayer cards? Raise up your hand and still say, oh my. Well, you never got that third. I told Billy, give prayer cards out to those. All right. You without prayer cards, raise your hand again. Let me see around where you're at. Mm, it's just everywhere. All right. Look to me. I said something last night I shouldn't have said. I said it quickly and then caught it back. I said the American people don't take the discernment. They don't like they do overseas. Of course not. The revival's moving there yet. But I said, until God leads me again, I won't use the discernment. After these campaigns are over, I'm going to stop. If I come again, I'll be praying for the sick. But did you notice I put, if the Lord leads me? Because I can't control it. He does the controlling. I'm just an instrument, just like this microphone. You hear me through this microphone. It isn't the microphone you're hearing, it's me. And it, it, I'm just a mute. That microphone without a noise to hit that crystal would be a mute. So am I a mute for these things, unless God speaks through me. Do you believe that? Did he promise in the last days he would do these things? We know it. Just what little temporary part that we have seen this week, we believe it. Somebody in this section without a prayer card, raise up your hand again and pray. God grant you. This lady sitting on the end here, looking at me. I seen you have your hand up. You didn't have a prayer card. Now you're close to me, so that the Spirit will start. Do you believe me to be His prophet or His servant? Do you believe that with all your heart? If God will reveal to me your trouble, will you believe me then? No, you know where it's the truth or not. You've had bleeding ulcers. You've had an operation for it. You're weary. That's right. Raise up your hand. Put up your hand if that's so. What did she touch? I want to have the lady to stand up. Stand up just a minute, lady. If the lady of no, I want to ask her a question. There she sits there. No prayer card. No nothing. Just a woman come in and sit down. But she was sitting there with faith because she's in a serious condition. Everything was told you is the truth. Is that right, lady? Raise up your hand. If what was said about whatever was wrong with you, raise up your hand. You. This, yeah, that's right. God bless you. All right. Now, I do not know the lady. Here's the Bible. I've never seen her in my life. She's older than I. We were born years apart, miles apart, the first time we meet. But what did she do? She was praying for something, and she touched the high priest, and as quick as it did, it touched right back through me and told her. Now, don't worry no more. You're going to get well. Your faith is safe. I'm going to be now, God, in this you believe it? Here sits a woman right here, weary, wondering, cancerous condition she's worried about. Believe with all your heart, don't doubt, just have faith. Believe that the Son of God makes you well, and you can go home and be well. You believe it? Miss Staub, that's your name. That's right, raise up your hand. We're strangers one to another. But Jesus Christ knows it. Just so you wouldn't miss it. You feel good now? Stop worrying. It's all over. Your faith makes you well. There sits a man sitting right back there in the road, sitting right back behind him. That man suffers with a hernia. He's a stranger. Do you have a prayer card? You don't. You don't need one. If you'll believe with all your heart, if you're a stranger, raise up your hand. All right? You're just a man. Come and sit down. Is that right? But you are interested in this hernia being healed. All right? If you believe with all your heart, you can have it. Amen. God in his people. God in his universe. God and His Son. God and His people. You believe it? Amen. Let me show you something. If you want, might not know. Here's such a woman sitting right here looking at me. She wants to do what's right. She's trying to do what's right. She's got a head and a smoking cigarette. She's trying to get rid of it. That's right. If you is that right, lady? Don't be ashamed. Stand up on your feet just a minute. I'm a stranger to you. Do you have a prayer card? 
You don't have one. You don't need one. You believe me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I curse that devil. May you never crave another one. Go and be well. In the name of Jesus Christ. I ask you to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe me. Ladies, I'm not very careful. I'm not very careful. Heart trouble. If you believe with all your heart, lady, God will make you well. God bless you. Go home. Be well. God makes you well. You believe it? Just don't doubt. Hallelujah. She's suffering. She wonders what's wrong. She's got cancer. She's also got a sister, a girl she's bothered about. Oh, she don't God have mercy. Miss Noah, believe with all your heart. Amen. We're strangers to one another. Never saw her in my life. If we're strangers, make up your hand, lady. You stand there and bring people you've got to die. Something will happen. Fear not. You won't die. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall live. God in His universe! God in His world! God in His Son! God in His people! Do you believe it? Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Sweeping across the whole audience. Do you believe with all your heart now? How many of you believe your pastor is out here to be a man of God? Raise up your hands if you believe your pastor. You ought to. He's just as much like to pray for the sick as I am. Brother, walk right down here with me. I want you to pray with me. And for these people, too. Come right down here. Come here, Roy. Take a hold of this. I want everybody in this line here that's got prayer cards, stand up over on this side. Right over here. Stand up right here. Everybody, what does the Bible say? These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Do you believe that? Do you believe that I am a believer? Say amen. Do you believe your pastor is a believer? Say amen. Amen. All right. Now we're going to call on roll by the book. Section by section. That section first. This section next. That one next. That one next. Don't come both ways. You get all mixed up there and you won't be able to, to listen to Brother Roy here now. And the pastors. How many more believing pastors that's here that really believe the gospel? Full gospel pastors. May you may be strangers. Would you like to come up and stand with me, brethren? We don't excommunicate no one. We believe if you're a believer in Christ. Is that right, my brother? Is that right, my brother? If you're a pastor here, you believe in Christ for the sake of the matter. If you're a believer in Christ and Jesus is of Christ, come here and lie here. And do your duty as a man of God to stand here and help me pray for the sake of the Come up here, pastor. Make a double line on here. I'm going to get down there with you just in a moment. We're going to pray for every sick person. I don't want to stand here talking long. I want you to pass through while this anointing is still up on me. You believe now with all your heart? Come out of here, Pastor. Have somebody come this way. Get out of the middle of the way right here and form a double line. That's good. God bless you. All right. Let's sing this song again all together. Oh, me.
with all my heart, I believe. I guess you wondered, many of you, why I would go from one end of the road to the other. And many of you noticed me taking your hand in mine. Did you notice that? How many noticed it? Raise up your hands. I was checking what was happening after them ministers was laying hands on the sick. And I'll say this with all of my heart, that at least 80% of them were healed before they even got to where it was at. There wasn't a vibration on them at all. That's exactly right. That's what I checked it for. Your pastors have faith, folks. Just believe in them. I love you. I believe you're God's children. You pray for me. I'll pray for you. And I hope we meet again. Until that time, until we meet. Until we meet. Until we meet again. Everybody together now? You love the Lord? All your heart. All right, all together now. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. All right. Till we meet. Beautiful music. Thank you for the good times we've had. They got a world's fair going on up here where all the world is displaying its scientific achievements. But the church realizes that right here, God's got a world fair showing his achievements, what he's been able to do with his church. I've enjoyed every minute, every minute. I come to you tired as usual, but I'll see you again someday. God bless you now. While we hum that song together, breathe a little prayer for one another till we meet. God be with you. God be with them and help them. Till we meet, Father, in Jesus' name, for God's name.